We are very fortunate to have Sasha Wade Zarenek as our circus lunch seminar speaker today. Um, Sasha was just reminding me that he and I met for the first time 14 years ago when he came to a uh, summer school on computational complexity. And uh, talking to him around that time, maybe a little bit afterwards, uh, it was, he had a very strong impression. It was clear that Sasha was not someone who wanted to do incremental research, but he would have wanted to think big and think about research problems that can really uh, change the world. And so he went on to do his uh, PhD uh, in uh, computational biology in uh, George uh, Church's group. And uh, while there, uh, helped found the Personal Genome Project, where he is now Director of Informatics, and he also uh, is uh, CEO, CTO of a C startup. Chief Scientist. Chief Scientist at a uh, startup, Curoverse, um, uh, which is uh, uh, based on, uh, aims to bring some of the technology to develop in the Personal Genome Project um, out more widely. And uh, so he's going to tell us about some of this exciting work uh, that he's doing, which uh, is indeed uh, to change the world. Thank you, Sonia. So I definitely think that uh, transparent informatics can re revolutionize medicine. But I don't want to keep you waiting too long about uh, what I mean by transparent informatics. So if you stare at the ACs, Gs, and Ts on the screen, uh, they'll start giving you a feeling pretty fast because this is a piece of my genome. And Actually, uh, you can download my genome publicly off the internet. Um, it'd be about three million slides like this. It would take us a while to uh, go over them. But, but the interesting thing about my genome isn't just you know, a bunch of ACs, Gs, and Ts, but small variations where my genome varies from probably most of your genomes here. Uh, there's a little C in red right here. And this particular variation is uh, extremely well correlated with um, high triglycerides. I, I have high triglycerides that typically it's a, uh, controllable. Uh, my mother had it, my grandmother had it. It's associated with heart disease. There's a lot of interesting functional studies that show that this particular variation actually affects uh, a little signaling molecule that, um, that can't um, work in the way that it normally works um, when this variation is present. So it's, it's, it's kind of fun to start thinking about transparent informatics you know, in the very concrete. You know, take public data and really start trying to understand what it means. And you don't need, you don't need a like, super complicated security clearance and stand on your foot and, and do all sorts of um, all sorts of things to promise me that you won't do anything nefarious with my genome, it's public, and there it is. Uh, and there's lots and lots of people like me at the Personal Genome Project, thousands of people actually, who um, are also sharing their genomes. And the hope is that this starts to crystallize uh, a commons that allows a much, much broader community of people to start bringing their skills to understanding medicine and ultimately uh, making cures more effective and much more individualized. So you can get my genome at this URL. Um, you already heard I'm a founder of Curaverse. Our goal is to make whole genome sequencing and other biomedical big data much more, more accessible and clinically useful. Everything, um, everything we do at Curaverse is, is, is free and open source software. And I'll, I'll talk about that more as we go along. So, so obviously one genome by itself isn't going to get us very far. We ultimately need millions of genomes, you know, certainly thousands initially, and, and ultimately millions, if not tens of millions of genomes, to really, um, combined with phenotype data, to really, to really begin to understand them. Luckily, that's not going to be a problem. In the next five years or so, we're expecting at least five million whole genomes to be sequenced. And of course, that creates a new problem because we're going to have 500,000 terabytes of raw data. And, 
And even though that data is very raw and it could be processed and compressed and all sorts of things can be done to it, 500,000 terabytes is still a lot, especially when you can imagine that, at, I don't know how many of you have had an MRI or any kind of medical imaging, but you can imagine that as this gets to the price um, of medical imaging and, and in five years it will certainly be there, we're not going to be talking about millions of genomes. Pretty much anyone who gets a medical imaging will probably get a genome done. And certainly, if you have cancer, you'll get genomes done multiple times. Um, now, um, one of the companies that we worked with closely, Complete Genomics, they're purchased by BGI. They had hoped to have um, the capacity to sequence a million genomes a year by next year at about $100 each. Uh, I, think, I think their plans are still underway, but at, at this point, the price tag that um, their kind of main gorilla competitor is predicting is still about $1,000. And, and, and you know what the actual costs for that competitor, Illumina, uh, is, is, is you know, not disclosed, but it's easy to imagine Illumina could get down to a few hundred dollars if, they, uh, if the sort of mar market brought them to that place. Now, you know, you might think, well, you know, 500,000 terabytes is still not that much data compared to what we have on the internet. But, but really, it's, it's, it's a lot. You know, we're, we're growing by sort of two orders of magnitude every five years. Uh, the internet, sort of the total data uh, kind of on disks on Earth is growing by about one order of magnitude every five years. There's every reason to believe that as biomedical data gets exponentially cheaper to generate, that we will be able to just keep generating more and more. Um, and to give you an idea of like how much biomedical data there is, well, the, the, the sort of biosphere, just nucleic acids alone, has 10 to the 36 bits of data. And it's kind of interesting to, to think about this, but humans are, are a 10 to the 32. So, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of data in the cells in your body and in the microbes in your body and in the viruses inhabiting those cells and, and mi microbes. So. Quite often people ask me about this. So if you're curious, you should ask, you should ask questions as we go along. This is a super small group, so I'm happy to answer questions as we go along. There, there are a couple of good ways to get at these estimates. So you can estimate biosphere biomass on Earth. Uh, for plants, and you can also estimate uh, the microbial population in the Earth's oceans. And both those numbers roughly produce the same 10 to the 36. Why are humans such a big part of it? Like humans are a very successful organism. Just, that's how it is. <laughs> it's kind of, a, it's kind, of a, kind of, kind of amazing, actually. So absolutely not, not doing any compression, because the problem is that when a sequencing machine reads out a genome, there's a, an error rate. And so you need to, you, for clinical purposes, you need to know, did you actually measure that little bit of the person's genome, or did you just like, not look at it? So by the time you start including compression of the errors, which is a totally big open research pro pro problem I'll get to later in my talk, uh, it turns out that nobody actually knows how to compress a genome to any kind of reasonable size. So it's absolutely true that we'll be able to get this number way down, but don't forget that m it's roughly equal the amount of data that comes from the microbes in your body and that comes from your cells in the body. And your microbes are dynamic. So over the course of your life, you actually have, your genome is not changing so much, but your microbial metagenome is changing a lot. So it turns out that it's very, very complicated to, to just say how, like, how compact you can get even with perfect sequencers, which we are nowhere even close to having. But you can't say that like, all humans share like, <coughs> and, we will, and we will get to that. We will get to that. Because that, that, that's, actually, that's actually a very important insight. Um, but it turns out, like I, like I just said, 
if you compress the human DNA, your microbial metagenome would not be compressible that way. So it wouldn't actually change the amount of data in a human by even one order of magnitude. If you got rid of all of the human DNA and you just, <laughs> you just were left with the microbial DNA, you'd, you'd still have about the same order of magnitude. Um, any more questions? I mean, these are interesting. I, I think these are nice, nice sort of, they set the trend. I mean, do you think the biosphere is big? It's good, it's good to remind people the biosphere is big. And this is just nucleic acids. It's not like this is everything in the cells in your body. So combined, you know, we have, on one hand, the way that the, the internet has dealt with all of this, this massive growth in data is free and open source software. So we have Linux on Android, we have the BSD kernel on um, iProducts, uh, we have GNU and almost everything. There's just um, an awful lot of free and open source software powering sort of technology today. And, and that, that has helped us um, kind of tame this data explosion in the, in the, in the internet scale world. So, when we define a transparent informatics resource, the idea is we want to take open source software and these public data sets that have been consented for research use and put those together. And that's, that's transparent informatics. Um, it's too much text to you know, memorize. Um, per, we, I've been working on uh, the Personal Genome Project for you know, almost, almost a decade. There are now uh, projects publicly launched in the UK and in Canada. There are many more projects launching all over the world. Uh, the idea has always been to wait for scale up. You know, let's not scale up uh, when genomes still cost a million dollars. When I was first publishing on this, genomes still you know, cost millions of dollars. So, so it's... It's silly to ask the government to go sequence, you know, thousands or millions of genomes when we know we're gonna we're gonna make things cheaper by another three or four orders of mag magnitude. And, and, and at this point, that's what we've done. So we are very very close at this point to hitting the sort of target where we could start enrolling people at a thousand dollars per person. We maybe still about a year away from that being able to hit that. Right now, we're maybe two or three thousand per person, but. It's, it's, um, it's getting very close. The idea is that people who donate their data, they also donate cells, and you know, they donate whatever they want. So, so then you can do functional studies. If you're, if you're wondering, OK, I saw the C in this person's genome. Um, maybe I could take some of their cells and do some experiments and uh, see if what I really think <coughs> is happening in this, uh, in this system. And that's, you know, that's a lot better than just, um, I don't know, hoping, you know, hoping to find lots and lots of people with that same variation and um, seeing what happens. Because obviously those people are going to have lots of other differences. Uh, you talk about some of the challenges of scaling the data, but how scalable is that part of this project? So we've enrolled about 3,000 people. And our biggest problem is not staying too far ahead of what we can sequence. So we've, we can sequen we've sequenced maybe 10% of those people. And we can sequence another 10% in the coming year or so. Right, 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 right. Well, well, but the nice thing about that is pharma has been doing that kind of stuff for a long time. So the, 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 the very unique part is can you find enough people that are crazy enough to make their genomes public? But we've pretty much demonstrated that yes, there's no problem finding enough people. Storing cells and so on uh, is pretty well established that you can do it all in for less than a thousand bucks per person. So that's, it, it's, that stuff is actually very highly ma automated. There's biobanks that will do it, and there's, there's, there's really a lot of infrastructure. Um, but that's why $1,000 was not intended to only include sequencing. It really was supposed to be an all-in number that would allow us to run this study for many, many years, uh, 
you know, decades and, um, and keep people's cells around and make, make things available to researchers and so on. Um, and we wouldn't necessarily have to get cells for every single person, but, but, but with a little bit of cleverness, it's, um, it's still valuable to have at minimum some DNA from every person so you can at least check that, that the thing that you're studying isn't a sequencing error, which you can't do with a lot of studies, a lot of data sets. Um, No, we're all volunteers. We're all volunteers. Yeah, yeah. It would be it would get super complicated if, if you paid people, um, especially especially because um, so our ratio of, of men to women is uh, two men for each woman, which is actually better than you might expect it to be. Um, the same thing with my uh, some minorities seem to like the project fine, and others, you know, are very disproportionate to, to their their frequency in the population. So it's it's um, it's it's easy to imagine that if we were trying to go after sort of underrepresented minorities that and then paying them, it would just it would just get worse and worse. Um, so. So, so given this sort of um, backdrop of open source software, public data, the infrastructure to kind of do this all around the world, you know, the, the question that I've always been fascinated by is, is there a way to organize uh, computational resources for these very different audiences, you know, for the general public, for physicians who tend to be extremely focused on their very particular need, um, you know, extremely high quality. For researchers who almost never care that much about quality, they're, they're really trying to get that nature paper and get the result in, you know, before their competitors. So there's a really, um, really wide variety of, 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 of users for the data. But if there's exabytes of data, it really doesn't seem reasonable for us to have multiple copies of this data. Like even if we have multiple copies because there's multiple copies on multiple hard drives or on tape, uh, you still want sort of one, one repository. Um, and, and, and that seems you know, kind of impractical. Like could you really have one hard drive in the sky for all of this? Um, and you know what? This is kind of what we have now. Like what we have now is people get genomes on hard drives. They they show up on lab benches, and um, and and there's just piles of them. And nobody nobody even knows if the genomes have have failed. You know the drives have failed. People will go back. I have I have I have drives this way shipped to me from Korea, for example, and. And four drives shipped to me, eight terabytes of data, two dead on arrival, sort of par for the course. Um, so the state of the art is really quite, um, quite limited. So what we really need is a platform. You know, we need something that all of these constituents can use and, you know, would, would, would really just replace these crazy hard drives and uh, sort of broken, the, the broken system we have now. So I was giving, I was, I was giving um, a talk to some pharma executives in December and asking them, so hey, you know, how, so what qualities should this, should this platform have? You know, and um, I put up this list and they gave me some votes and it was, I was quite happy. So pharma executives, it turns out, they have you know, they're multinationals, and so they, they want to share data sets between data centers be, without moving the data because they, they, they definitely have sequencers on different continents. So for sure, they don't want to move the data. They don't want to ship hard drives. Um, but then as you go along and you ask them more questions, it turns out that they weren't really that interested in doing high-performance queries on their on their data, 
because that wasn't really their job. Like as long as, as lo getting answers from the data right now is not really on the forefront of their minds. Like their job is to just be able to tell their, um, you know, their managers that yes, we've got the data stored. We're not shipping hard drives anymore, <laughs> but but it's going to be it's still a while for um, for the industry to to get to a point where where people actually. Okay, so we're not shipping hard drives, but can we do interactive queries of this data, kind of the way we do Google searches? You know, no, that's we're not we're not there yet. Um, so, so um, you could ask, well, okay, so why don't we just use sort of standard internet technologies? You know, there's Hadoop, there's all sorts of things that we could use that would um, that would help us out. Well. We could, but there are a bunch of unique requirements um, in biomed. So obviously the, the, the regulatory requirements are um, similar in other fields. There, there is something to be said about, about this, this idea that in biomed the data is owned both by the person whose body the data is generated from and also the various institutions that paid for the generation of the data. And there's like a very interesting problem there that may not exist so much in other fields. Um, but obviously there are, there are compliance and regulatory requirements in other fields. There's also a provenance uh, requirement. You know, in, in biomed, you're very, very concerned about um, being able to repeat a result that you, you, know, you, you, uh, you gave a patient many years ago to be able to justify that you did the right thing. Um, and then you get to this issue of, well, wait a minute, you know, a genome isn't 100 gigabytes. Like, it should, be, it should be very compressible. So because genomes are so compressible, you should have a lot of IT infrastructure that, take, that can do queries on the compressed data. Well, how do you do that? That's, that's very specific to biomed. So I'll, I'll go over these quickly. So, so sharing. Um, we want to have some kind of federated system. We want a system where projects exist all over the world. They have their local, maybe they, maybe they have a local cloud provider, maybe they have their own data center, lots of hospitals do. But for sure, you know, China and the US and the EU can afford their own physical data centers. So you're going to have to have some kind of federated system. And you know, some people will opt out of federation. Some people will use federation only within their own organization and not federate with other organizations. But ultimately in biomed, if you have a patient at Mayo Clinic and there's another patient in some health system on the other side of the world that has similar um, sort of genetic fingerprint, well, you're gonna wanna share data. So there's a need to share data in biomed that's very strong. Um, and this isn't true for you know, Facebook and Google. You know, they don't have to allow their competitors into their, into their data centers. Um, Google has recently launched Google Cloud Platform. You know, Facebook hasn't any need for anything like that. Um, and it's unclear if Google Cloud Platform is really running all of Google's applications. It's, it's, just, a, it's just a competitive business to AWS. So governance, we've, you know, we've already talked about security, provenance, you know, the ancestry of computations is very important. And actually, if you know the ancestry of a computation, then you don't have to, then you don't have to um, store all the copies of all of the intermediate data sets. Um, when, when people search for Paris Hilton on the internet, you know, nobody really cares if you can repeat the exact same uh, search results five years later. But, Again, in biomed, that becomes something important. We've already talked a little bit about unique data. And so when you put these things together, um, you get our uh, Arvados open source platform. And we, we've, um, we've, been, we've been working on this for many years. It actually started out as the first chapter of my dissertation. Uh, we're in the process of launching a, a nonprofit. That, that can bring together lots of for-profit 
um, companies and nonprofits. They're all kind of building the same infrastructure. None of this infrastructure is terribly important to Mayo Clinic or to Harvard Med or to anybody else. They all consider it sort of plumbing that they wish they didn't need to do, but then they still spend a million dollars on it and they don't do it very well. And then when they want to share, they can't because their snowflake is different from everybody else's snowflake. So the hope with the Arvada Foundation is that people can start really to pool their resources on an open source project and actually build a platform. Uh, we have a couple of racks of this stuff running at uh, data centers. We actually used to have a rack in this building. Uh, it's now at Summer Street. Um, but uh, for many years, it, there was a rack in this building. And um, the, the architecture is kind of what you would expect. Uh, Arvados is an open source project that can run on any kind of cloud platform. So it can run on OpenStack on, in, your, in your data center, or, or it can run on Amazon Web Services, or Google Cloud Platform, whatever whatever you may, may want to do. Um, and then it, it stands up applications, like, like the applications that run the Personal Genome Project, or, or applications that drive your clinical lab, or whatever, whatever application you may have. Um, this this uh, architecture diagrams at arvados.org. Um, but I think. I'll give you a little bit of flavor for the sort of most interesting um, technical challenges. So say you, um, you're a patient, um, and you want to be able to go to your health provider and start typing in symptoms. And you want the provider's portal to tell you, do I need to go in or not? Now. I mean, right now, you know, probably you can get a nurse practitioner on the phone sometimes. Usually not. Usually you have to go in in person. Um, but it would be nice if you could at least do some screening um, using, using a provider portal. And there are a lot of big providers that are working on that. The National Health Service in the UK is working on this. VA is working on this. Uh, Kaiser is working on this. Lots of, lots of work is going into, into doing this. And big, big partners is, is working on it. It's, but it, it's obviously a hard problem, right? You, you want to be able to, to take advantage of everything in a person's medical record and in their, in their genome and in their imaging. Um, and use it to help inform, you know, how important is this symptom for this person. You know, for the average person, the symptom would be nothing. But for you, you better come in. Um, you know, a doctor might want to, to know, you know, do I give you drug A or drug B? Um, a scientist might want to make all of, the, like, all of these previous um, queries more effective. So, Whatever, whatever the application may be, um, we need some kind of real-time query engine. So we've been working on one of these. Um, it's called Lightning. And for those of you who you know, don't know anything about the next generation sequencing world, it turns out the way you actually sequence genomes today is by doing fluorescence imaging of, um, of, for, of amplified DNA. And so that's, um, th those are absolutely gigantic data sets. And, th and they, they just get processed and thrown away. And they get turned into these things called reads, which are just sequences of ACs, Gs, and Ts with some quality scores. And the reads are the thing that's like 100 gigabytes for a genome. And then um, once you have um, reads, you want to be able to compact them into some kind of representation that maybe you could even store in RAM. In, and our hope has been that you could, if you could put aside the reference data, uh, maybe in a few gigabytes of reference data, then maybe you could get a, an individual's genome down to, say, 10 megabytes. And then that's something you could very reasonably hope to store in RAM. And then a million people's genomes would be something that you could reasonably and potentially you know, affordably uh, query. Identical. Well, you said that maybe there are like small bits that might be different, but 
just as a very simple thing, maybe ignored if you would be surprised. But if we can focus on the, I don't know, what percent of the DNA is really very different between people. I don't know, is it like 1%, 10%, 50%? So, so so, so I'll give you I'll give you a scheme that actually goes well beyond doing that because you, you really don't it turns out that you really do want essentially lossless compression of a person's genome and you can do that with 10 megs so there's no <laughs> there's no need <laughs> there's no need to ignore important parts of their genome which are important <laughs> yeah yeah but but as it happens, a baseline doesn't get you very far because it turns out that lots of sort of the, 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 the nooks and crannies of the genome tend to be where all sorts of interesting biology happens. All sorts of very, uh, the, there's lots of jargon in medicine. So one of the terms is uh, it's called penetrance. So penetrance um, is uh, an indicator of how uh, likely if you have a particular genetic feature that you'll get a, phen a particular phenotype. So things that are fully penetrant, if you have the genetic feature, you always get the, you always get the phenotype. So Huntington's disease is like that. Um, there are, if you have the trinucleotide uh, repeat that leads to Huntington's, at least in the, in the sort of right range, then the chances of you not getting Huntington's are terrible, you know? Um, and so, so there are lots of features like that um, that it turns out um, are, are still actually uh, very inaccessible to modern sequence, next generation sequencing, uh, but are very, very important. You, you really, you really want to get them for clinical purposes. So. Is sequencing by now things considered a solved problem? No, no. So it's not, not a solved problem at all because for, for, for many reasons. So for the, the biggest reason is cost. So it still costs thousands of dollars to sequence a genome. And uh, it turns out in cancer that uh, tumors grow in populations. So you have some, some tumor cells in there that might be drug resistant in a, in a very large population that is not drug resistant. So you may think that you're going to kill the tumor by, um, by sequencing a sample of the tumor. You give it the, the drug that works on the sort of the most of the, most of the sample. But what you really wanted to get was those little handful of cells that were resistant. Um, you get those chunks that are not even from the same so. Right, right. So, so what that means is potentially you could be sequencing the same person a hundred times or a thousand times. Or I mean, you you know, you have ten of the um, fifteen cells in your body. So th there's there's a lot of um, there's a lot of sequencing to do. Um, and um, that's so so so, so th it's very unlikely that call. And that was the point of my biosphere slide that there is no we will never. In no time in the near future, in the next 10 years, let's say, even if sequencing gets cheaper by a factor of 10 every couple of years, uh, will we get sequencing so cheap that we want to stop? There will, be there will be very good clinical reasons why we need it even cheaper. Um, so. And, and that's, that won't be true for everything, you know, that won't, but, but, for, but cancer is about half the, the, the market right now, so that's probably good, a good enough reason by itself. Um, so it turns out, I mean, we've been using genetics for, um, for diagnosing patients f since the 50s. I mean, probably before that, but, but the... Um, Various sort of standards organizations have been forming standards for um, how you, like for nomenclature, you know, what do you call this feature? What do you call that feature? How do you store this data? Uh, it's been going on for, for decades and decades. People in next generation sequencing have, have kind of forgotten that the, the field is actually very old, and so we, if we want to be clinically useful, we actually need to incorporate all of the work that's already been done with older technologies and show that 
our new technologies can do some do the things that the old technologies can do because as it happens they can't um, it's just uh, it just turns out they're a million times cheaper but there are certain things that are still inaccessible is there any websites or anything which has in fact accumulated this in some kind of a Wikipedia type format uh, yeah so past stuff because it, you know it grows so much in year and a half that it's probably a lot but it's nothing compared so to we that. actually have um, a project, uh, it's evidence.personalgenomes.org. Evidence.personalgenomes.org. And uh, the project's called Get Evidence. And it's like the Wikipedia of knowledge for genetic variation. Uh, based on the Personal Genome Project. But anybody, anybody can use it. And, and it, it's, been, um, it's been a project that we haven't um, you know, put as much time in as, as, as really it deserves. But part of the part of the the challenge has been that that clinicians tend to l work in private, and so they're still very very uncomfortable with the idea of citizen scientists editing their interpretations of genomes. So this there's a lot of work for us to do. Um, but but anyway, the idea um, with Lightning is let's let's get a genome down to about 10 megabytes. And then, um, and then we can start, um, we, can, we can take a person's genome that was represented in one format uh, and translate it to a different format. And over time, if this, um, if this sort of lossless compression or nearly lossless compression um, is, is effective, then people will start uh, generating genomes in this, in this uh, format to begin with. They won't use um, some of these GVF, GVCF, VCF formats that people are using today. And part of the reason that those, pro those formats are so problematic is that, is that every time a new um, a new kind of consensus on what a reference genome is comes out, then all of the coordinates of everything changes. So you say chromosome one, position one million, that used to be this very important gene, but now we, we've updated the reference and now chromosome one, position one million means something completely different. And if all your medical record has are these coordinates, then it gets really hard to compare genomes because person A is generated in one build, and person B is generated in another build. So there's all these sort of very technical problems. Um, but the, the basic idea, um, this slide is probably a bit too small, but the basic idea is that these little green boxes here uh, are tags. So there's just 24 base sequences. So 24 letters, A, C's, G's, and T's. They're guaranteed unique on that person, and in general, they're unique in the population. Um, and so on both ends. And, and you use these little tags as markers. And so you can start talking about a region of a genome between two tags, and we call them tiles. And so a tile that causes high triglycerides, like the tile in knee, um, that gets a name, you know. That gets an uh, that gets a stable ID that the world can use as that's that's the thing that causes tri high triglycerides in this particular way. Um, and then the reference tile, or the the blue blue boxes, um, these ones here, um, those can be stored away in um, they can be stored away in our in our database. Um, so. It's, it's really a very, very simple idea, but, but as long as your variations fit in between the tags, and you can actually choose the tags so that most variations fit in between the tags, uh, because human genomes are extremely non-random, so you actually know where the, populate, where the bulk of the variation is. Um, go ahead. Translate it to terms that they understand. So, saying that there is like a higher level alphabet, just instead of using these four letters, you use like a different set, maybe a larger set. Exactly. Like big, bigger chunks. Yes. Okay. Yes. And, and, and 
these chunks happen to be, so that there aren't that many chunks and everybody. 10 million chunks, 10 million chunks. Uh, well, 10 million tie, yeah, 10 million. Like mil alphabet of size like 10 million, which is, I guess. Yeah. So uh, I, I wonder actually, it's probably not, I think that's the right idea, but it, it's uh, the idea with the 10 million tiles is that they tile across the genome. So within each of those positions, you would have an alphabet. Because because the the tile refers to the tile refers to a position. So in a particular position, you only have say I don't know. Instead of having three billion, instead of having three billion positions, now you have ten million positions. And in each position, there's only. Seven and there's eight. and there's a, li a very limited alphabet. The vast majority of humans only have a, f a handful, you know, less than ten. Um, Tiles. Yes, yes. It, 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 it's a very um, non-random thing. So, so the, the, the number of tiles in most positions is, is tiny. No, so one of the, I mean, this is, this is what, you know, for those of you who are cryptographers, you know, there's this funny intersection in cryptography between the social sciences and kind of humanity. That you, you know, it's it's not in, to build a good crypto system. People like like a voting system, right? You, people have to ordinary people have to use it. And so this is this is a little bit like that. For people to use this new coordinate system, people have to like our choice of positions. Our 10 million positions have to be positions that, as a whole, the, the community likes. And that's, and that's kind of the, that was the point of this, that these, these little black and white blotches, it used to be that you could stain a piece of DNA, stick it under a microscope, and you would get something that looks like this. And so you used to actually diagnose genetic diseases by um, generating diagrams like this. And so the, there were position, there were about 700 or so positions on the genome, and each of those 700 positions could be associated with a disease. And so that, that's exactly what we're doing, is we're trying to work with this sort of very diverse community. Some of these doctors, I mean, they, they have secretaries to type their emails. They have no clue how to use a computer. Um, very smart physician. Good compression is not just something that you know, another computer scientist can use a program to reproduce the original data, but something that other people can run their already existing, sometimes very simple methods. Yeah, I mean, what we're trying to do here is is, is create a tiling that the world and and I'm part of a, a FDA committees, NIST committees. There's a there's a sort of an international consortium that's growing, that's working on this problem. So, and, and I'm part of all of these different committees. So the, the goal is to, is to really get to that, um, to that place where we can, where we can um, come to a new way to address the genome. It, it's, it's almost like you're in a satellite looking down at Earth and you're noticing correlations that could be due to weather or geological phenomena. And deep inside that stuff, however, are the atoms, are the chemicals. So my question is, I understand this from a point of view of clinical diagnosis and cast typing and so on, but how does this and the chosen 10 million relate to the whatever, 30,000 or so uh, proteins? How, do you, how does this, this world tie into the world of protonomics and, and, and biological pathways? Right. So it's not, uh, the mapping isn't very complicated. So, I mean, from my, I don't think it's very complicated. I mean, uh, the genome in, in a sort of, in the normal picture is just 3 billion positions. So when you reduce it to 10 million positions, there's just bigger chunks. But those chunks still Span some normal, some some variable length of position. So, if if uh, a gene that you happen to be interested in used to require you know thirty thousand positions, 
then in this formulation, it might require 10 positions or 100 positions, just depending on the, um, on the size of the chunks involved. Okay, so maybe you answer the question. So what you're saying is these tiles do not overlap the gene boundaries. So in other words, if a gene was 3,000 uh, uh, bases, yeah, yeah uh, it's not like a, t like a gene is going to go between uh, one begins at the beginning of it in some part of a tile and another one starts in a tile. The tiles respect gene boundaries. Yeah, so it's not necessary, because it turns out there's all sorts of things outside of gene boundaries mm -hmm. that uh, control how the gene works. So there's no easy way to you know, respect, respect gene boundaries. Um, but for some things, uh, there, there's the portion of the gene that directly codes for protein. So there's a mapping directly from from the DNA to RNA to protein. In those cases, you could actually, they're called exon boundaries, you could, you could respect exon boundaries. I mean, what, what we've found is that this is, none of that is, is, is too important. There's just some set of tiles that covers your, G, your, you know, your region of interest, and that's, and that's perfectly, that's, that's all you care about. When you do a query, and you want to know what is the variation in my region of interest, you use these larger chunks that we call tiles. And that's it. You know, as you, as you get further, further down um, at the sort of individual base level, uh, then, then you actually, each, each, um, each tile refers to a specific sequence. So it's not, it's not as if, it's not as if um, you're hiding the sequences involved. The sequences are actually present in that alphabet that you're, uh, you were talking about. Each position has an alphabet where the alphabet represents the different sequences in that, in that region. Are the tiles the same size? No, they can be variable length. Between what and what and typical? 250 average. Genes? 250 bases. Uh -huh. um, you can sort of back calculate it, right? 300 times 10 million is 3 billion. So just make sure I understand the tiles are defined by, you choose some unique 24 bit tag sequence. Identify everywhere they occur in the tiles are just the things that occur between. Is yeah, that right? that's right. So if a person uh, differs on that tag, does that mean that their tiling is completely off? Or? Uh, you mean, oh, right, that's right, that's right. So, so that's, let's say this person here has their, they don't have this tag. Right. So then, then um, they get what we call a complex variant, and it spans this tag and this tag. So you always, even complex variants, end up um, getting demarcated by um, by, the tiles. by by tags. By tags. Okay. But it, but the, the trick is to choose an encoding where the vast majority of variation, and especially clinical variation, happens in tiles because everybody's everybody's going to like that encoding better. <laughs> Every time you have to use a complex um, variant, it's just less um, convenient to work with. Um, so, and and there's a bunch of there's a bunch of uh, it, it's not too important, but it's worth it's just key, just so you understand why there's two rows of boxes per person here. Uh, you get one copy of your DNA from mom and one copy from dad, um, and it can sometimes be quite important which copy um, a very vari uh, variation is on. So, for example. Uh, in metabolic disorders, what can happen is that you have some enzyme, it does some important metabolic function. If you don't have that enzyme, your body doesn't work properly. Uh, but you have two copies of the DNA that will produce that enzyme. So if one of the copies is okay and the other copy is uh, deficient, then you're probably still going to be okay. But if both copies are deficient, then you know you're in, that then you won't have that enzyme and you won't and you'll have a problem. So so it can be quite important 
that this tile and this tile are on the same copy. So this orange and yellow, as opposed to this one's blue and blue. Because if it had been the other way around, and this was a, an example of a metabolic enzyme or a region encoding a metabolic enzyme, then, then the other case would be much worse. Um, so, and, 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 and cur just to just, just make things fun, current sequencing technology, at least as it's normally practiced, doesn't get this information. So there's, there's all sorts of um, quite open-ended problems that are, are left in sequencing. We, we, have a, we have a paper from last two years ago now um, of how to do this, uh, but the technology is still not commercially, commercially available. So, of course, this stuff should be federated. You know, openness is important. Um, and this is just a bunch of us at the GET conference uh, last year, and thank you very much. More, more questions? So in some of the <clears throat> motivating examples you gave, uh, the uh, patient querying the portal, decide whether they should come in or not, um, and also the sort of direct uh, care by a, a doctor. So it seems like there's more going on there than just a change in technology. It's also a change in the way care is done. So, no, uh, um, so presumably, sort of statistical analysis of populations and so on currently is not directly. Um, uh, is not directly part of, of uh, uh, the care of a patient, but is sort of there. There is the uh, uh, that contributes to the increase of sort of general um, medical knowledge. Goes through vetting and peer review. It's published, and then eventually caregivers learn about the results of these studies and what, what it means for patient care, and they maybe change the way they care for their patients. But it's not that um, one does, you know, given a patient does some big data analysis to run their medical record against uh, some large population and yeah. make some decisions about care. So is, I mean, just talk about the possibility of a transition like that happening in care. What you know? What are the pros and cons of being right? Along those lines? Right. I mean, I think that I think that. So the first step is that is the idea that there is a persistent, queryable data set associated with a patient. Because that is already not, that, that, that's already a huge leap. You know, for, at, at present, as you were saying, you know, there's nothing query, I, I mean, maybe your doctor will look at your notes. Um, but for the most part, they're going to be most interested in the test results they ordered for that specific visit. Like, they really, they really think in terms of, of you come in, you have some symptoms, maybe you have some history, I order some tests, I look at the tests, and that's it. And then new transaction, new transaction, new transaction. All healthcare is delivered via these, these transactions, and there's very, very little reuse. If I happen to have an MRI from five years ago, or even if you have an MRI from the same region of your body, just from a different institution, a lot of physicians are trained, do not trust that other institution's MRI, do not trust their radiologist, reorder the test. So, so there's a big, there's a big, a big um, need to make it, just, just to make it possible to have enough kind of data liquidity that follows a patient around that you could meaningfully query data that's been generated about that patient. 
um, in, in clinical context. And I mean, it's, it's very non-obvious, but this, this idea of these three constituencies, patients, physicians, um, and scientists, they, they really have completely different kind of um, funding structures and interests, and they have, com so if, if you can make a, um, a platform that supports applications for all of those different those different groups, um, it'd be very powerful. And 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 the, the 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 reason to think that this isn't you know just dreaming is that places like Kaiser, places like the UK Health System, places like the VA, they're all working on this. Um, right, but what you just described just now isn't the. So originally, what I heard was sort of the blending of roles that the part of what a scientist currently does would now be done by the physician or even by the patient to some extent. What you describe now is not so much that, but that the same system would sort of support yeah. all three and maybe expand what a physician yeah. and the patient currently yeah. do, but not, not turn them into the scientist that is. Right. Right. I mean, I, I, I think that's right. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's hard for me to, um, you know, I should probably have a talk just, just about this idea that, that, that it's not that we're trying to turn the, the three groups into each other. Although they may end up needing to learn some common vocabulary and things just because otherwise it's, it's you know that's sort of better for the world anyway, um, but but it does seem important that they be able to kind of work off the same data, uh, and that has never been never been possible. Are you aware of any movement or any oh. seeds or hints of it that would be the following? It's where patients, people, get disgusted with the whole system. They get disgusted with the attorneys. They discussed it with the legal and all of this stuff and the privacy, and they said, look, we are all have a common thing that we're all terminally ill. You might have three months with the pancreatic cancer. I might have 40 years, but we're all terminal. So let's get over this crap. And what I want to do is I want to give you complete cell samples, blood samples. I want to give you my whole family history. I want to you know, tell you what my diet is, et cetera, et cetera. Give you full details of my environment, what I've been exposed to and that of all of my family and on and on. And you suddenly got five, 10 million people to do this. Now you have the richest stuff that we've been kind of screwing around to get. And you'd suddenly find, oh yeah, Bayonne, New Jersey's connected to this kind of cancer, or gee, you know, uh, this family history, or. So, so, so is there some, is there any move where the people just say, we're sick and tired of this, we want the data, and so, we're gonna give it to you yeah. as a hell of our privacy. So there's, I mean, that's, that's, you know, the personal genome project in a nutshell. But, but I think the thing you have to keep in mind is that it's not, it's not enough to make the data public. You have to make it attractive to the experts to actually use it. You know, it is, it, there are going to be scientists and physicians that are very turned off by it. Um, you know, sort of patients saying, well, you suck, so I'm going to make all my data public. Like, y you have to, <laughs> you do, you really, you really have to, um, you really have to be more inclusive than that. Um, and so what that, what that has meant, and I think that's what it means for the Arvados project, is that, is that we, we want hospitals, um, who, who maybe don't do any research, and we want researchers who uh, maybe don't see patients, and we, you know, we want people in cryptography and uh, in computer science, and, and, and we want ordinary patients to all be able to work on a project where they've all um, contributed, but they still see the value of each other's roles so that they end up, edit, you know, they end up contributing to the same resource. Because if the, if, the, if the doctors go off and play in their corner and the scientists go off and work in their corner, um, and 
even if the patients make, make this amazing resource available, like for example, the Personal Genome Project, then, then the, the, the actual potential of the, re, the resource still isn't, isn't realized. But then we should really have to educate multidisciplinary people to begin with, because these disciplines are a tower of battle. Right, right, and that's why public data and open source software, I, you know, I think it's really essential that everything be completely transparent. So I hate to cut off the, the questions, but we are out of time, so let's thank Sasha again.